here, but I'm um, actually on my way on a rainy day to release the chickens and ducks in the backyard. So as I go about it, thought, you know, I'd start talking about a few things. One of these things is why is a grown man playing with it in a pack of toy? So the purpose of this whole kind of series is to uh, try to uh, see if my honeybees can make enough money to buy me two alpacas. So that's where I want to start. Hey, say good morning, guys. It's a little bit late, so they're a little bit antsy. Come on, guys. So I'll try some feeding as I'm talking. So the toy alpaca. Uh, he is basically just kind of a demonstration of what we are eventually going to, to have. So I'm going to try to put a picture in, right? So this picture is of basically I call him a Tony lookalike. So a live Tony lookalike. And that is, that's where I'm going. That's where I'm trying to uh, take this series. Uh, it is a wet, cold, rainy day. It's February 5th. Uh, I said Northeast Florida, and I specifically say part of Florida, or the part where I'm at, uh, because beekeeping itself is very specific to region. So things I do might not necessarily work for where you are. Uh, general beekeeping biology is the same everywhere. And these ducks are kind of loud. But... So, beekeeping biology is all the same. The differences that you're going to see is kind of like when I do things, or maybe even sometimes kind of little specifics how I do things or might be a little different. And of course, some of that stuff varies beekeeper to beekeeper. So, today, uh, like I said, it's rainy. I want to start building some swarm traps. So, first, I want to talk a little bit about swarms and kind of what they are and then I guess off to Home Depot or Lowe's to get the swarm trap material. Alright, so we're talking about swarms and what they are. Uh, we're on our way to Home Depot, got my driver, Greenlee, got my uh, wood carrier, Keith, in the back seat. And so, uh, swarms, they are how the bee colony reproduces. So although the queen lays uh, eggs and you know that she raises individual bees, the bee colony itself is a super organism. So uh, when the bee colony gets healthy enough and full enough, basically half the bees and the, the existing queen leave. But uh, in the meantime, as they're getting ready, the, the colony knows that they need to uh, produce a new queen. So before the queen ever leaves, they've started uh, making queen cells, and you'll, you'll see those, they look like little peanuts, kind of on, uh, on the outside of the, the comb, usually around the edges. Um, and so uh, that's how they reproduce, that's how the colony reproduces. So as, uh, as I mentioned Honeybee Democracy last time, and it's a really good book. I was actually listening to parts of it again this week. All right, so before the existing uh, queen leaves, the queen cells are made and the bees inside of them are uh, about to emerge. And so the existing queen and about half of the bees will leave the colony. And so they'll leave the colony and uh, congregate somewhere pretty close to where they're at, uh, probably like 25 to 50 foot away on average, not usually, away from the uh, existing beehive. So usually it's on a branch or a fence post or somewhere like that. And essentially scout bees will go out and look for new homes. So as the scout bees go out, all the queen and a lot of the existing workers, like nurse bees and everything, uh, congregate in that area. And you have a lot of movement, right? So the, the queen's usually closer to the middle. They're keeping her safe. And at this point, the, the swarms are not dangerous. They're actually uh, extremely docile when they're in a swarm. They don't have any honey or uh, the hive to protect, and they're kind of in survival mode. So as these scout bees are going out, they're finding ideal places where the, a new beehive uh, would exist. So they're looking for a few things. They're looking for size, 
uh, of the um, potential site. They're looking for like safety, they're looking for insurance size, they're looking for all these different conditions. So as the scouts go out, they'll find, uh, just say, a, uh, a tree opening, right? So this, the scout will go in there, kind of scope it out, see how it is, and she'll go back to the, the bee swarm. And on the outside of the bee swarm, she'll start to do the waggle dance. So waggle dance is also used when the bees find good nectar or pollen sources. That's how they tell uh, the workers where to go, the foragers where to go and get it. So it's the same thing with swarming. So the, the scout bee that's looking for new homes will come back to that, that swarm and she'll start to do, do the waggle dance. Now the, that's interesting enough. So this waggle dance, uh, the more vigorous she does it, uh, the more excitedly she does it, that means it's a really good nesting site. And so as other bees go to check on it, uh, they'll come back and do the same kind of waggle dance. So they'll do almost like a consensus. And if somebody, if one of the bees is really excited about her site and thinks it's, it's better than anybody else's, they'll actually headbutt and stop other scalp bees from doing the waggle dance to tell them where their spots are. So over time, all these other scouts are going and checking you know, the, the best site out. And when somebody comes back and says, you know, this is a good site by doing the waggle dance, um, they get a consensus. And that's how the bees know where to move. So after, <laughs> this is probably more interesting than that, but after they, uh, so the waggle dance tells them what direction uh, to go in to find this new nesting site. And as the bees leave, so they start to leave, they, uh, they start to fly off into to that nesting site. It's a giant cloud of bees. And it looks really intimidating, but again, they're, they're very docile. They're just trying to find a home. Uh, the, there's actually, the, the bees that know where they're going will, are, are called streakers. And they're not the streakers that we think about, you know, running across the football field. They're, uh, they, what they do to direct where the swarm goes is they'll fly through the swarm, fly through the center and then fly back around the outside and fly through the center. And basically, like an arrow, they're directing the swarm where to go. And uh, that's, that's really cool. So when they get to the nesting site, they, they get in and they, uh, they basically build a, build a new home. So I mentioned the importance of swarm traps uh, is what we're doing. We're trying to collect those, those swarms and those bees. Uh, I, I mentioned before, a uh, responsible beekeeper should have a swarm trap, in my opinion, because if their bees swarm for anything, then those bees are going to look for a good nesting site, which could end up in somebody's house, somebody's garage, or just like even in a tree where they're not necessarily wanted. And you can park them wherever here is fine. Um, okay. The uh, so swarm traps are important. And so that's what we're going to be building today. There's also, um, so I'm going to be building these swarm traps to be able to fit into my top bar hive. So when you build a swarm trap, you want it to be kind of an open cavity. And so a lot of people recommend just using a Langstroth hive, uh, so the old box hives, and just putting no frames in it and letting the swarms move in there and just letting them attach to the top. So then you have to cut it out and put it in the hive or you just shake the bees. But doing it with a top bar, they attach themselves, the, hot, the combs, to the top bars so you can actually just move those straight into uh, a regular hive. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. So I got a material list, we're at Home Depot and we're gonna get that and hopefully get started. All right, so we got back from Home Depot. So I picked up two 2x12s, picked up a couple 1x4s, and I priced out a couple 2x4s. Um, I already had a few from existing jobs, existing house projects we've been working on the past few months, so I didn't purchase any, but I'll put the prices of all of these things in. Um, we also got the uh, wood glue, and we got this flashing. So the flashing is uh, for the roof. You can do alternatives, like if you have any corrugated aluminum or anything like that, you can screw it down to OSB. Basically, just so water doesn't get on the top bars and run through, anything to keep it dry. Um, I'll have all the prices with these, and I'll put them in there just so you can kind of see. A um, couple things I want to talk about. So, one is uh, 
it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of money to get the alpacas. So with this whole experiment, whole project, what I'm trying to do is make it so the bees uh, are getting me the alpacas. Not so I'm spending uh, approximately 2500 which I'm thinking is uh, the cost of two alpacas. Uh, not that I'm spending that much to get alpacas, so if that makes sense. I'm starting off with uh, about $300, and I'm taking this material out of it. So that's the $300 is just anything related to beekeeping. So uh, there'll be a running total, and I'm going to call it the, uh, the alpaca fund. And so you'll probably see it in the corner of the screen, just to kind of keep track of where I am every video. Uh, another thing I want to do is complain about lumber prices. <laughs> so these pre-COVID, lumber was a lot cheaper. I'm not sure if it's the manufacturing or what, but prices have gone up a lot. And Tony is not super excited about that. He's, just, he's a little upset because uh, he wants some friends. And third thing I want to talk about is if this is at all beneficial to you or if it's the least bit entertaining or educational, um, please like or subscribe and you can also hit the bell to get more uh, notifications for any new videos that come out. If you guys have any questions about any of this stuff so far, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, try to get back to all of them. Um, so yeah, so here we go. It's time to start measuring and cutting. Before we begin, let's address safety concerns when using power equipment. Tony said he's going to help us understand how to use it safely, so we will remain safe and not get hurt. So these are the measurements on the 2x12s. And the reason I set this up is I originally set up my top bars to be made out of a complete 8 foot 2x12. So what that means is the two ends are 15 inches and on a regular top bar hive I make the sides are 33 inches. So that comes just shy of, uh, just shy of the 96 inches. So what I did with these top bar swarm traps is I'm just building them uh, half the size of my normal top bar. So if you see, um, I measured them out carefully. So the top one has a 15, 15, 16 and a half, 16 and a half, 16 and a half, and 16 and a half. The bottom has 15, 15, 15, 15, and two 16 and a halfs on the end. Now this should make me three swarm traps. And I know we looked at the cost already, and you might think it's a little bit high for some swarm traps. Uh, but you got to remember that we can use these as nukes later on to do splits. If, if we don't catch anything in the first uh, probably two to three months, uh, then we will just turn them into to nukes and use, use them as splits for my other top bar. So just to make sure that I get the measurements right, I haven't built one of these in a few years. I brought one of my empty top bars from uh, my apiary. 
Uh, as you can see, I kind of trimmed down the side of that 2x12 here. So I got to make sure I get that measurement right. And before I was doing screen bottoms, as you can see, in the towards the bottom. Uh, I'll for the swarm traps we need to do a solid solid board so they they feel it's a secure cavity like it would be in a tree. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do next. Work on getting these measurements correctly, uh, and I'll show you how I do that when I get them. Thanks. All right, so we have one of the 15 inch uh, end pieces. And this is showing the angle and what it's going to look like when I put these other boards in. And here's the measurements. This, this is four and one eighth inch over is this. And you can see that it, the corner will run over a little bit, but then cut back. And for the top opposite corner, the measurements are three quarters inch over and three quarters inch down. And the same thing for this side. You got this three quarters inch over, three quarters inch down line, and the four and an eighth. 3 quarters inch is so these top bars sit right on top like this. And I'll show you how one of the 16 and a half side pieces fit on. So that'll basically fit on just like this. So like I said, we have a little bit of run over down on the bottom. Um, and at the top, it runs just like this. You can bevel it and take this corner off. Uh, it, should be covered by the the ceiling piece that I'm going to make, so I'm not necessarily concerned about it this time. So start screwing these together, and we'll see how they look.
All right, so this part where we start cutting the wire, uh, always be careful because your fingers can get snagged very easily. And the wire, like the flashing we'll cut later on, is uh, unforgiving with fingers. There's a couple different ways to do this, uh, this bottom screen board. Um, I kind of prefer to make it so that the screen runs along flat with the, where the bottom of the hive will be. You can also, and I've done it before, kind of go in from the other way. So the screen kind of sags a little bit from the bottom and you end up stapling from inside the hive. Uh, I found either way, it doesn't really impact how much the bees like it. Uh, they're usually pretty indifferent to it. The screen bottom, like I'm doing here, um, it does impact for those top bar beekeepers that like to use uh, division boards, where it basically, it is kind of like a piece of board cut out to fit inside the hive where the bees cannot get past that. The screen, how the bottom screen will give a little bit, um, the bees can get around those divider boards. So doing it this way might not work. If you're doing a solid bottom, then the divider boards work a lot better for that. Um, but this, uh, not so much. This one I'm gonna, going to have the wire run over um, the bottom. And why I like doing that is because I will actually paint this, the bottom part of the 2x12 and paint over the screen. This gives some extra protection uh, from like things being able to get around or get up through the screen, which is usually a question. Uh, so, I mean, high beetles are a pest that impact bees. Most of these openings are still usually too small for them to get in. Ants can't really get in. But just putting that paint on the, the wire kind of uh, soaks up those holes so they can't get through it. I also like to just generally protect the bottom also. Uh, and I'll do painting here in a little bit. And so you'll kind of see how I do it. But I never paint inside the hive where the bees are directly impacted with the paint. Now this, uh, this plywood I'm cutting for the bottom cover of the hive. So with these swarm traps, I'm wanting to make it so uh, after I catch the swarm that I can just go and unscrew the bottom plywood. So right now I'm cutting out that plywood and I'm gonna paint it. And later on, you'll see me, I'm just gonna do a couple screws through each side. So uh, when the hives get, start building and they're in my apiary, I can just take that plywood off and they have the screen bottom. Screen bottoms are good for here in Florida. Uh, we have, uh, obviously it's a lot warmer here and the summers are really hot and it's easier for the bees with the screen bottoms to regulate the temperature. Also it allows in, uh, top bars or well any hive so if the bees somehow like uh, are cleaning themselves and throwing like the mites off the mites will be able to fall through that that bottom screen and uh, you might have less mite issues for that here i'm cutting the entrance holes so i have the measurements on where i'm cutting the holes at i prefer holes at the bottom and this <laughs> drill bit you might think is way too long uh, it's basically an inch drill bit uh, I think it's, I want to say it's like 12 to 18 inches long. I actually bought it a couple years ago when I was trying to get a beehive out of a tree. Um, that's a story for another day, but it did not work out. Um, so yeah, that's why the drill bit's so long. So like I said, I like the entrances towards the bottom and uh, it just helps the bees kind of come and go and keep things clean in that spot. And here's me cleaning the hive. And I'll be quiet for a little bit and let's enjoy the sound of the rain. All right, so now it's time to start making the top bars that go on top of the hive. I found it cheaper and even easier um, to just get a two by four and rip it down with my table saw to three quarters inch sections. Uh, some people might ask like, why don't you just buy uh, you know, one by twos or something like that? 
And my argument is those one by twos, as they sit in the warehouse, they get all twisted and uh, they're just not very straight. I found cutting these two by fours, they, they tend to stay straighter longer and it's also cheaper normally with normal prices. So like I said, this, uh, I'm just ripping it down to qu three quarters of an inch and I'll rip down uh, the whole two by four into different sections. So since I used the two by four, you'd have to do this with one by twos also. Top bars are the most critical um, measurement in, in the hive. So there's something called B space, and that's what uh, one of the things that made the Langstroth hive so popular is that he figured out how to have removable combs that incorporated B space into it. And so B space with a top bar, it's best to cut the three quarters inch bars so that they are an inch and three eighths apart. So that allows the bees to build the comb right down the center and it allows them the perfect space to be able to work each side of the comb without touching the next comb right beside it. So the, uh, the top bars themselves will stack uh, in, the, in the hive horizontally. And as the bees build on just say the first bar, they'll start to build onto the next one and that uh, is why they need the bee space so they have adequate room to work and so they don't bump into each other. All right, so it's time to take those top bars and make a groove inside of them so we can have the, uh, basically an insert to where the bees have something to hold on to. So bees will naturally go into something and they'll kind of as they're building the wax and building the combs, they'll grab onto a low point. And that low point, basically other bees will grab onto them and they'll form these chains. And the chain that they, they form of bees is called festooning. Or basically they're kind of passing wax up the chain and the, uh, the bees at the top are forming the wax into the, uh, into the, the comb shapes that we, we are familiar with. And so what I'm doing here is I'm just right down the center of those top bars, I'm just making a slit. Um, and I showed you, and after I make the slit is when I will cut the bars to 15 inch lengths. And 15 inches is the same as we cut the ends of the top bar hives also. So uh, it just makes it so it's kind of flush and it runs flush across the top all the way down. Uh, and that way we can build a roof that sits right on top. Uh, obviously, it's easier to, like I did before, just run that, that groove down before we start cutting all these. And once uh, they're all cut, I'll measure them out and I'll pull up the miter saw here in a second and start, start chopping them up. Alright, 
so we got a lot of cutting done tonight and we got the main boxes put together uh, we got the top bars in uh, we got Tony asleep over here uh, it's almost 10 o'clock so I think I'm gonna stop cutting probably hit it in the morning so I have to finish the bars I have to do the roof and do something to uh, get it to hang on the tree so got to do that tomorrow it's been a long day of run errands and everything in between so see you in the morning all right so just real quick wanted to mention next week's project which is you can see all the garbage bags back along the fence and all of this old crepe myrtle stuff we are actually going to be doing some raised beds probably two foot raised beds um, got some other stuff I'm gonna stack in it. I'm gonna use the leaves to kind of pack underneath it. Uh, we'll show it'll be like my modified uh, permaculture hugel mound. So we'll see how well it works and give it a try. All right, so that's next week. All right, so now it's time to cut the the roofs for it. These are my roof measurements. Uh, I just prefer to do it. It's kind of easy, kind of clean. Uh, it's probably more on the expensive side because of that flashing. And I, I find it just, like I said, kind of cleaner. Um, I do have some old videos, but I can't find them, of me opening these old lids and uh, big wolf spiders running. And I'll, I'll deal with bees all day, but put me around a wolf spider and that's when uh, you'll probably see me scream and run away. But uh, yeah, I still, I prefer these. And uh, there's, like I said earlier, you can also put uh, plywood to cover them or any kind of uh, alternative roofing. Uh, you can search top bar hives and see some pretty cool pictures uh, and images also of them making them out of like cob and clay uh, in, in other countries. In fact, the top bar design, uh, you know, I don't know if it came from, you know, Africa, but uh, this variety of top bar that I build with the uh, with the slanted sides is actually called a Kenyan top bar versus a top bar with uh, straight down vertical sides, which is called a, a Tanzanian top bar. And so this extra 16 and a half inch uh, board I have, basically I'm gonna cut it into three sections. And these sections are gonna be used to give a place for the roof to rest on top of the top bar. Uh, you'll see me here in a little bit I'm going to, uh, after I build the box, you'll see me nail uh, one of these to each end and then put another one in the middle as a brace. So the one in the middle just kind of keeps it elevated so rainwater won't sit in the little crevice and it'll just help a flat roof kind of shed the rainwater like it's supposed to. All right, so I'm using that uh, 18 inch board and I'm nailing it into the 20 and a quarters. So the 18 inch board should be fine for the, uh, the width of the hive and the 20 and a quarters for the length. So use plenty of wood glue for this just to kind of um, get it to stay. Uh, I also like to check the square. So make sure that it's, um, you know, has good 90 degree angles, which you don't see me do. Uh, and uh, just to, kind of, to keep it straight, uh, I am using trim nails. You can also use little screws, but make sure you drill those pilot holes because you'll split these one by fours and one by threes all day. Now here's me putting in those, those strips, uh, like I said, and that's what this roof is really gonna rest on when it hits that, uh, when it sits on the top bar hive. Without these strips, You'll put the roof on and the roof, the metal will be sitting on the top bars, which I prefer not to do because I feel like that kind of wears it out a little bit, wears out that metal. And uh, it's just, it's not quite as secure. I do like uh, the fact that these slide, the roof will slide down uh, about a couple inches overlap onto the top bar hive. That helps it so the wind is, can't pick it up as easily and I, I might have mentioned earlier uh, I don't have issues with these roofs blowing off uh, even as light as they are just because of how they're built and how like I said they overlap and they sit down that roof will sit down into it 
uh, during hurricanes or, you know, if there's a bad storm coming, I will definitely uh, strap these down. This is just me doing a little painting. Um, I like to paint it before I put the metal on it because the metal is going to overlap each side an inch. So this painting is just for protection uh, for, from the elements. Um, with the paint, I don't think I mentioned earlier, I'll use any paint that's left over uh, from any jobs. As you can see, my uh, hammer twirling ability, which I uh, worked on, that might have actually taken me a couple couple takes to get that down. But I uh, feel like I really developed an ability that'll be beneficial for me later on in life, uh, especially if I'm ever the gunslinger that I want to be. So I won't bore you with painting all of these. I think I just kind of show how I, you know, kind of popsicle stick the first one just so I can, without getting my fingers all nasty with paint all over them, and they dry easier that way. All right, so now it's time for a tedious part of this job, and that's cutting out the inserts that are going into the top bars. So we need little strips, and they can be um, three quarters of an inch or shorter, but they're they're going to slide into that groove that we made earlier. So that groove is about a blade's, uh, uh, you know, the saw blade thick, so eighth of an inch-ish. And it's always kind of a struggle because as we, you know, cut these out, if the <laughs> board isn't held completely straight, uh, it's easy to kind of break the thin piece that we're getting. So you'll see, I'll kind of hold it up and show you how thin of a piece it is we're cutting. And these don't have to be perfect as far as how they fit in. Uh, I do put a couple of specks of glue to get these to stay in that groove, but most of them are, are thick enough where you could probably wedge them in there and they'd stay. If you don't want to use glue and you're uncomfortable putting glue in your hive, I understand. And you can use honey to do, or sorry, you can do uh, melted beeswax to do that. And that's just a profile of how thick this stuff is. Very thin, very easily to break. Yeah. So here's a comparison of what I used to do. So I used to do these wedges and they're also tedious to cut out. <laughs> and then you nail them in. The problem with these wedges is the bees uh, will sometimes kind of build, they won't build straight. If you see this profile of the inserts trenches. that we're building now, it's very straight. So the bees don't really have that broad area where they can uh, build a, a curved, Do I uh, the ones or not? a curved yeah. bar of wax. So here's oh, the difference between the two. You also use a lot less wood building these uh, bee inserts, and they go a lot faster. As you can see, I'm just taking a. Um, I measured before this to approximately 11 inches. So 11 inches are is where that top bar slit is, as if they're pushed up against my saw. And so I'll take a whole handful of them. I'll cut, you know, probably, you know eight to 10 or whatever that is at a time. So it really doesn't take me too long to cut all of those. So the next step is going to be measuring these top bars and figuring out, figuring out where to put the, the inserts in. So I do rip the bar, like you saw, all the way down. Um, so there is kind of a little, you know, little tiny speck of a opening on the side of the bar. Um, but I'll measure it two inches, kind of do a cheap shot and just uh, measure them very quickly with that speed square I have. Put a few pieces of glue in there, stuff them down in there, get them, you know, they're pretty tight and that glue is going to hold them in there. And then I'll dry up all the residual glue just to get it out of the way so it's not kind of all nasty and in the way. And here's my, my wonderful cameraman, a little bit bored, kind of showing our progress as of this point. Uh, he's really shooting for me to get a drone so he can do these cool shots. All right, so next step is that flashing that we mentioned earlier. And this flashing, like I said, it's unforgiving. So I'm cutting it into 24 inch uh, pieces. So the width of it is 20 inches already. So if you're thinking about that 18 inch piece we cut earlier, uh, that gives two inches extra, one inch on each side. And if we cut it uh, this 24 inches, it gives us, um, you know, a little bit, you know, over an inch on each from the front and the back, but it turns out easier. Uh, this is a 10 foot section. So uh, it's, like I said, you can get several of these out of it. And if you can see, I have my index finger pointed out 
and that's pushing that metal down because that metal is will try to get up and slice you into your back fingers without that index finger there pushing it down. So here I'm just measuring the inch on each side. And if you haven't noticed already, I've definitely sped up these videos, <laughs> this instructional. So it's, you can see what I'm doing, but it's not, doesn't take quite as much time out of your day. So I like to get the first piece bent and ready. And again, I'm not a master craftsman. Uh, these are for bees and they're outside and I'm not selling these. So my craftsmanship isn't super great, but they are very sturdy and they're extremely functional. So I use these uh, short self-tapping screws just to uh, uh, drill into the metal. If you wanna drill little, if you wanna use regular screws, you can just drill little holes. And with this flashing, it's pretty thin. So most regular screws will, will drill through it anyway. Uh, and like I said, we, we get a few on each side and uh, we'll turn it over, bend down the other side, try to make it as tight as possible. Uh, and then, you know, do some screws through that. So again, I like these metal roofs because they shed a lot of rain, they, they hold up really well, and you know that they're, they're waterproof and they're lightweight, which top bars are great for people that don't wanna lift a lot of weight because you're not unstacking, you know, honey boxes. So building a light roof kind of keeps it, keeps it light, uh, keeps it easy on your back. So again, you'll see I just clip these ends so we're able to fold the sides of the metal down. Um, if I spent more time, I could get it a lot nicer. <laughs> um, but again, these are gonna be out in my field or up in a tree for the time being while they're uh, swarm traps. And so I just wanna get those, that sharp metal pieces bent down so they're not snagging on things, snagging on my clothes or you know, more importantly, my skin uh, as I work them back and forth. Uh, so that's what I'm doing. And again, just putting in a few of those screws just to keep it uh, tight down. And you'll see me on the other side, I you know, kind of repeat the process. Uh, and I definitely like to bend those, those corners down. Uh, just so, like I said, snagging it is not very fun. <laughs> Cameraman decided to kind of do a little video about him washing down his favorite piece of lawn equipment. Uh, believe it or not, I'm not funded by uh, John Deere or anything, but uh, Keith's just very proud of his lawnmower because prior to a few months ago, he was push mowing. So he likes to keep this bad boy cleaned up. So we are almost there. We are now cutting the hangers. So I'm doing two pieces. So we're gonna screw uh, a nine inch piece uh, flush with the bottom at the back of the hive. And on top of that nine inch piece, we're gonna screw a 20 inch piece that actually has uh, a part drilled into it with a hole saw. Now here's me measuring this out and you'll see how this comes together in a minute. So I'm measuring uh, and I'm making sure it's in the center. So this is for the hole saw measurement. And I cut the hole saw measurement short because it took me forever with my dull hole saw to drill all the way through this pine two by four. So what this is gonna be is a hanger. So we'll be able to hang it on a tree or on a lag bolt or on a nail and into something. So here's me starting the, the screws in the first board. 
So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to screw that in first. Like I said, it's gonna be flush with the bottom. And the reason for this is because we want that roof to fit on. So if we had this all the way to the top, that, you know, if it went flush with the top two, the, that roof that we built earlier wouldn't be able to slide in over top and be able to seal and close all the way. So here's me just trying to get it centered because we, we want it centered because when we hang it on the tree, uh, we want it to be up and down, not angled or, you know, anything like that. Uh, we might need to do something with a tree as when we hang it just to make sure that it's, it's flush and kind of somewhat level. I mean, we can push stuff behind it or things like that. We'll be able to figure that out when we get there. So that piece is in and these are three inch screws and these top bars aren't super heavy. So I'm using uh, three for each uh, board to hold them in. And I think these are more than enough to hold up the weight of that top bar, even with a, a colony of bees in it. Remember about uh, 12 to 15,000 bees are about three pounds. So they're not adding a whole lot of weight. Uh, if this was filled with honey, it might be another story if it was hanging from a tree. Um, another reason I like to uh, screw from the back is so when we want to turn this back into a nuke, we can just unscrew these while it's sitting on the bee stand. It doesn't bother the bees, that's not an issue. And if we need to, we can even stick some caulk in the, the screw holes that we leave in the top bar. So there's the hole at the top that will hang from that, uh, from that tree and nail. So here's the bottom piece of plywood that we're putting on. And mine, I don't like to go all the way over. Florida, we have a lot of humidity. So that humidity or anything like that, or if it leaks, I want it to be able to have a place where that it comes out. I've had uh, Langstroth style nuke trap or swarm traps that uh, will get water in them, and eventually it'll just uh, from it'll just uh, rot out the bottom. So I'm trying to avoid that using this. And I'm just showing a screw that came in the box that was messed up, and that's why I was struggling a little bit with it. <laughs> but that occasionally happens. So we're basically done. We got our hanger, we have our bottom, and it's time to show off the finished product. Let's see it, Keith. Swarm trap, it's done. So swarm trap slash nucleus colony. Uh, works out pretty well. You got the lid, the lid fits in really tight, fits in good. If you need to weight it down, you can do it with a strap or just put something heavy on here. Uh, mine are fine. I've never had to really weigh them down, even in storms. Uh, hurricanes, you might want to strap it down. So if you look in the colony, we got the, the top bars all in here. Uh, you can open them up one by one as you get them checked. Uh, hey, look who's in here. Look at this guy. So it was a swarm trap, and we turn it to an alpaca trap. There we go. We'll bring him out a little bit. So, Tony, swarm trap's done. What do you think? I think he likes it. So put him over to the side. Make sure he doesn't get paint on him. All right. Also, with cutting it in half for my full-size colony, we also got the, the half bar back here. So as you're working it, you can pull this out first. I always work from the back. And as you inspect them, you can slide it to the back so you have room to break each of them off. So benefit of the half bar. So we got this. We got it all buttoned up. So if you have any questions, put them in the comments. I hope this helps you out. And if you catch any bees, then I guess you get to join the club of Beekeeper. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see y'all next week when we build the Hoogle Mound slash raised beds. All right, later guys.